got to 18, I got arrested and incarcerated for three years. So when I came home, I had eight years of probation. And when you're on probation, I couldn't really leave the country. I see. Uh, hustle culture life was just not leading me to a place where I was happy. I made $5 million in our first two years of business mm. uh, as a company. We had a lot of cash sitting in our in our hands. We just constantly took a lot of the money that we had coming in, bringing in two, 300000 a month. We were pushing it out and hiring people, doing this, doing that, because instead of kind of sitting with the money and relaxing, we were like, oh, okay, now we got $5 million. Wow, this money, this money, this money. Let's put it here and invest it here. Let's invest it here. Let's build our team here. Let's build this business. Cause we're like trying to do chase, so much. Chase, chase. And then I realized that, you know, that is what led me to burn out very quickly. When you're an entrepreneur, you're escaping the rat race, mm. right? You think that you're like, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a nine to fiver. I'm not one of them on the plantation, right? But really, in reality, you work 10 times more than a nine to five person because That's when that nine true. to five person gets off of work at five o'clock, mm -hmm. oh, their day is there. They're not thinking about work. And since I was 13, I've been, money has been on my mind since I was 12, 13 years old. Really? From like, oh, bro. And then I got to a point where I started having people selling the drugs for me, right? You know, three or four guys that were selling drugs for me in my area. So I've literally lost three years of my life freedom mm -hmm. from, from money, eight years of my freedom of movement internationally. From, from, from money uh you know my youth a lot of it was spent behind money i wasn't really playing and doing things like that as mm -hmm. much i have the money that i need to be free but i keep thinking i need more which is now doing the opposite of making me less free I see. and then the less free i feel subconsciously the less desire i want to do the thing that got me the money in the first place mm -hmm. If I don't want to do something, you're not gonna. Nothing in the world is gonna make me do it. Really? And so, uh, nothing, not even the money. Will, nothing will make me do it. I don't care what it is. If if I lose interest or passion or something, mm. nothing is gonna make me do it. Now I realize, okay, what I'm looking for is freedom. So mm. now I won't take anything on that's gonna jeopardize my freedom. For most of my employees, are paying sixty to one hundred thousand dollars a year salary. You know, for one person. For one person. And we had a staff of thirty. 30. 30. What do you say to African Americans who said we sold them into slavery? I would tell them to shut the fuck up. That's what I would say. <laughs> I would say that's what I would say. Really? I'm gonna look right at the camera. If y'all still talking that stupid shit in 2024, you can shut the hell up because this is why. Hello, guys, and welcome back again to another amazing episode. And this is the Diaspora Transition episode where we have dialogue with diasporan who decided to leave the diaspora behind, either being the US, UK, other Caribbean countries, and currently living here on the continent. Uh, today, we do have here someone very special, someone who makes millions in his sleep, has taught millions. I mean, thousands of people are how to make million. And uh, today I'm lucky to have him here in the studio with me. We're about to dive in, you know, into his story. He's looking to relocate to Ghana. He's here currently. And I'm surprised to see him here in Ghana, to be honest. One thing, I, Ghana, you don't know who you're going to meet, right? So without further ado, Francis Quay, welcome on the show. How you doing, man? Nice to, nice to be here, man. Been actually blessed to be here. Yeah. Looking forward to it for a long time. I can't believe you are in Ghana. <laughs> Hey man, you know I had to come back home. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, it's been a long time coming, but I'm glad I finally made it to the country. Yeah. Yeah. Now I want us to go back to the. You you are a stock trader. Yeah. I think the first time I saw you, your video was I think with um your EYL. Mm -hmm. You know, teaching few people how to you know trade and stuff like that. Like, right. I want to go back to the beginning of your story, um, how everything started for you. Um, even the idea of relocating to even teach people on the continent how to trade stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, briefly introduce yourself to people watching you for the first time. Sure. And let's dive into it. Well, my name is Francis Quay. Like uh, Hayford said, you know, I teach stocks, uh, I teach stock trading, um, also futures trading. Pretty much any way to make money in the market is kind of what we do, or what I do with our company. Um, you know, as far as like why I, I came or, mm -hmm. or you know what gave me the idea to start looking to, to do this type of thing here in yeah. Ghana um, pretty much it's just a matter of um, you know I've always been big on the brain drain that happened I'm a product of the brain drain that happened in Ghana a long time ago when um, you know Ghanaian citizens um, you know a lot of Ghanaians left to Ghana to go to US. the UK to the US my father was one of those people mm -hmm. uh, he was born and raised in Kumasi mm -hmm. uh, you know grew up uh, another part, part in Tema um, and he ended up leaving here around the age of 17 when his father passed away um, and he went to Switzerland and Europe and things of that nature and he hasn't really been back since and so 
him and his five brothers all left. They're all, you know, from doctors to um, engineers to my father's a software developer. And so I watched all these skill sets leave the country. Um, and I, I just always have thought to myself, like, man, you know, all the time you hear about people complaining about Africa and the problems that we have, whether it be corruption or whether it be um, services that aren't here, medical, things like that. And I just look at my family alone and I'm like, man, mm -hmm. so many of those problems could be solved with just yeah. us. Like we literally have like five or six doctors That's in the family, the heart family. surgery, yeah. heart surgeon, brain surgeon, like, you know, uh, pharmacists, like yeah. so many skill sets. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know, I just don't want to be part of the problem, you know, mm -hmm. rather be part of the solution. So, you know, my skill sets have a lot to do with uh, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. tech skills, mm -hmm. um, investing and trading and things of that nature. So, you know, I just realized that if I was going to do something and spend my time on something I really am passionate about, mm -hmm. then it would be, um, you know, coming back and being able to be a part of the solution when it comes to those things. I like that. Now, how was your first? I mean, is it your first time in Ghana? This is my first time out the United States. Really. Interesting. Like, I mean, I've been on cruises and things in the Caribbean, but like outside of the general Americas, I, this is my first time outside. Interesting. Yeah. And you're a Ghanaian? I'm a Ghanaian. Ghanaian, Ghanaian and Liberian. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. What was your first impression when you touched down in Ghana? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, man. I was definitely like, you know, I had these expectations mm -hmm. already preset of like what I thought Ghana everything would be. was going to look like and what it was going to be like and things like that. And um, I'm not going to lie, like the first week I was kind of like, you know, a little bit um, like underwhelmed, I guess. Like I was and also overstimulated because mm. when I got to Osu, you know, I came straight to Osu and Osu was just like so much going on. And then also people can sense that I'm not from here. So like immediately I was getting like all this like, you know, people follow me, ask me for money, ask me for this, like trying to like find ways to like, you know, get me to to do stuff, you know what I mean? And um, it just was a sensory <laughs> overload, bro. Like I, especially as like an introvert, I'm not really, yeah. you know, used to, and then I just was so shocked because mm -hmm. um, I wasn't expecting to get that from, you know, I, I've watched some YouTube videos before yeah. I got here and of some like diasporans yeah. that were saying stuff like that. And I was yeah. like, man, you know, if you don't want to be there, you just go back. Yeah. Like, and I was like, damn. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I got here and I was like, oh shit, I see what they're saying. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you get to the airport, you know, you got somebody who's trying to take your bags and immediately you want some money, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, which is, I get that. Yeah. But then, you know, you get to, my driver got, got there and, um, you know, I got to put the suitcases in, yeah, in his the car. car. But then somebody's like trying to take Help the suitcases out. from it. Yeah. It's like everybody who touches your suitcase and gone, as soon money. As you got to pay. Like, yeah. it's like. If anybody touches your suitcase, they want, you know, a, a kind of a tip or whatnot. So I'm like, okay. that's how we say it. Give yeah. me some more. <laughs> Give me some more, some more right? Yeah, exactly. So I was like, okay. So I, 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 no, I already yeah. kind of knew that because my family, like, had already told me. Yeah. But then when I get to Osu, I'm like, as soon as I step out of my hotel, I'm getting like yeah. crazy. I can't even walk down the street. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So they, could, they could sense that you're not from here. not from there, right. Yeah, maybe your outfit was hitting nice. Oh, nah, <laughs> so like, it's crazy. It's not even because I was I was conscious of that so I only wore like yeah. this, I've been rocking white tees yeah. and like just basics you know the whole time but it's just something about like you know how yeah. you walk how you yeah. move and I, I get it too because now that I've been here for some time like I can see Americans like walking down the street and yeah. I know like okay that person you know you just immediately know so I get it too um, yeah. but once I kind of got used to to how everything moved mm -hmm. and then also once I got in, out into kind of like the more slower areas yeah. like Tema, Tema and, yeah. uh, Dawenya, where which is where my aunt and my family yeah, it's stay. more calm it's calm and um and I was able to like my brain was able to process how things work better mm. because then I started to see like see I'm like used to like planned communities in the states yeah everything is planned you know you have commercial buildings on one side you have residential buildings on the other side yeah. you have things you know multi-family properties here but in Ghana, in the wind, in the areas that I'm at, like, it's like, okay. It's a contrast of everything. It's everything. It's like, yo, you got, you might have 10, like, kind of uh, roadside mm -hmm. shops right here, um, commercial building right here, a store, three houses, yeah. you know, everything is kind of like everywhere. So I'm like, okay. Once I started to process, like, yo, this is really just like, mm -hmm. you know, we're, it's, it's, it's beautiful because it's like, it's the collective 
brain that's mm-hmm. building it. Exactly. It's not like the government planning the, the yeah. areas. Yeah, gentrify like, the whole place. Or... Yeah, it's like whatever the people here decide to do is mm-hmm. what they're doing. Like yeah. in Community 25, um, I, I saw a lot of that. I saw, mm-hmm. you know, um, people who built gated communities right there with the paved roads and mm-hmm. da da da. da. Mm-hmm. Somebody who built a pharmacy. There was something like this person built a pharmacy yeah. and, uh, and a hospital. And because he's a doctor from the UK, oh, wow. and he came and just built a hospital, and mm-hmm. it, but it's right in the middle of a residential neighborhood, and mm-hmm. so it's like it's things that are just developing, mm-hmm. and that's just once you kind of get used to that, yeah, it's just a beautiful thing, you know. Like it's, it's free, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. free. So but you know, normally people say that they feel at home being here in Ghana. Exactly. Yeah. How do you feel? Yeah, yeah, I definitely feel at home. Like yeah. it's it's but see what it what it is is like. The, the hominess from it comes from the freedom part of it, mm. right, to me. Mm. So for me, even though this is my home, like my family's literally, you know, generations, generations here. For me, coming back, where I, the, the, the place that I find peace and the place I find to make it feel like home is, it's like, you feel like part of a collective. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You feel like, like okay, we're, we're all out here making things work you know what i'm saying and once that clicks for you you know then everything you really do feel at home you feel Mm -hmm. at peace and it's like of course you have your drawbacks and you have your your benefits but the drawbacks is like i can deal with that you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. like it's way different from the drawbacks in the states where you always feel like an outsider no Mm -hmm. matter what yeah like i don't care how much you wealth you got how much whatever you're always going to feel like an outsider and if People want to debate that fact Mm -hmm. as a black person, any black person in America, Mm -hmm. you know, I would just say, like, we all know um, that, you know, when you walk, when you go anywhere in the States and you see a lot of American flags, right? Like, it reminds you that the same for you. (laughs) It's crazy because. It doesn't even have to be the racist flag. Mm -hmm. We got like two flags. We got like the the Confederate flag and we got the American flag. Mm -hmm. If I go somewhere in the States and I'm driving, let's say I'm driving through the countryside or I'm driving through a town yeah. that I'm not from. I'm trying to get from one city to the next. And I'm driving through that town and I start seeing American flag bumper stickers, really? American flags on the houses. I immediately know that this area is racist or is not really? for me. Seriously. It's like, I can, I, you just know because people like, it's like the, mm-hmm. uh, the patriotism that we see in America. It it's comes like, with hate. It comes with hate. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's built off of uh it's built off of attacking somebody else mm. you know what i'm saying it's mm-hmm. not like it's not like oh we're proud of a country because we built this together it's like there's it comes from a place of it's like the, it's the group of people the whites that yeah. who built you know or built quote unquote the country it's when you see them like carrying that level of pride in, in this united states flag it's mm-hmm. like it's because they it's the country that they yeah. love. It's not the country that we experience. You know, it's the country that they mm. have come to know and uh and, and want to build. Yeah. And it comes on anti Native American, mm-hmm. anti black, anti Muslim, anti Hispanic, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. It's like it's that type of thing. And so you just know the same this place ain't for me. Wow. Yeah. And I mean I think everybody gets a sense of I mean maybe I'll just speak for myself, yeah. but I get a sense of, you know, if I get pulled over here, mm-hmm. I'm, it's gonna be a problem. If I'm it's here not past, be a problem, like, yeah. yeah. If I'm here past dark and I'm by myself or something like that, yeah, I'm not. It's not comfortable. Yeah. You see what and I'm I think the first time we met, you were like, I literally had to walk from my hotel, twenty minutes walk to meet me. Mm-hmm. Will you have been able to do that <laughs> casually in the states? Well, yeah. So it yeah. depends on where I'm at. Okay. If I was in like a place that was like a uh, country, you know, like um, where there's a lot of those American flags, yeah. I probably would not feel as comfortable. <laughs> Um, I also wouldn't feel as comfortable also in yeah. certain black areas that are like hood without mm-hmm. being having some type of protection. And I'll say something also about that. Like, you know, my first day I got here, two of the guys that were at my hotel, the bad guys, mm-hmm. invited me to um, go have fufu and soup at this local fufu, spot. I see. So I went down with them. My immediate thought was they probably trying to set me up naturally off break because in the States, <laughs> you got people who are like, Oh yeah, you know, they don't even know you from nowhere. Yeah. They're like, hey man, come hang out at this bar with us, like, you know, later on, right? Not even like we talked or had yeah. a good connection. They just randomly were like, hey, you know, oh you just got in? Yo, come hang with us at this bar. And when they came in, I had I had like um like 
I just changed a bunch of money into CDs. Yeah. So I had stacks of cash stacks, sitting yeah. on my table. And when I they uh, opened the door to the hotel, they came in and I forgot that it was there. So like I'm thinking, oh, like they've seen they've that. seen the CDs, boom, yeah. boom, they want to go hang out. So naturally, uh, my thought process is, okay, they might be trying. But I'm like, <laughs> you know what? Let me just risk it. Let me just it. risk it and just go, you know, because I'm always on my P's and Q's yeah. anyway. So we go, da da da, have a good time, we eat some fufu and soup. So we start talking. And I'm like, and you know, when we get into the restaurant, I sit in a certain place. Like when I sit in the restaurant, I'm always sitting where you can see the door. I can see the door. My back is, you know, against a wall or something like that. Um, and so I'm talking to them. I'm like, yeah, man, you know, it's funny because I, I was, I ain't gonna lie. I thought y'all might have been. On the <laughs> They're like, what? They're like, that's crazy. We don't, they don't even think about those things. No, it's not yeah. even like a thought that crosses their mind. And um, it's just such a different experience, you mm -hmm. know. I was telling them, like, even how we sit in position mm -hmm. in a the restaurant, they're like, bro, we don't even, it's not even a, a It's not thought. a thing here. It's not even I see thought. most Americans always want to sit with their back at the wall and they, they want to see the gate. Yeah. They will never sit with their back at the ear uh, uh, facing the gate. No. Because something can happen in the U.S. Exactly. Something can happen. Somebody can walk in. You got shootings, like school shootings, or yeah. people just randomly coming in and shooting stuff. You have, um, we're just always thinking, and I'll speak as men too, mm -hmm. particularly as men, as black men in particular, like when we're walking, we're always thinking about what could happen. You know, mm -hmm. like this guy's walking next to me, like if he decides to do something, like, you know, how do I deal with that? How do you defend yourself? Um, you know, if. We're somewhere in a restaurant, like we're constantly playing these scenarios in our head. And I used to think I was like the only person that did it, but I started seeing other people on like social media saying the same thing. I'm like, oh, we all <laughs> thinking the same yeah. thing. But over here, you don't, it, you just don't process that. It's not mm. the same. Um, and, and then people are just so comfortable to walk at night to me when we left yeah. you that night, yeah, at yeah, Treehouse, yeah. when we left. Around and, like 8 p.m. Yeah, me and uh, the dude I came with, we're yeah. walking and, um, and I was like, you know, he was like, yeah, the hotel is over on that side. He's like, yeah, you could just walk there from yeah. here. And I was like, walk in the Weird. middle. It's like, it's like 9 p.m. I don't know about walking. It's yeah. the middle of an area I don't know about. I'm like, dude, I'm not walking over there. So I called an Uber, but he walked to like wherever he was going. Yeah. And it's like perfectly normal, perfectly comfortable. And mm -hmm. so it's just something you got to get used to mm. as an American. It's like not always being so on edge. You know, it's like. It's like just always being on yeah. edge. It's whether the, it's the police. I don't care if you're not doing anything bad or not. Yeah. You don't have to be a criminal. But you're just always on edge. The police might do something to you. Uh, you know, somebody else, a black person might do something to you. A white person yeah. might do something to you. Like, it's always that yeah. type of thing. And it doesn't make you relax or calm. Never relax. I remember you said something like you, you had like 10 things on your itinerary. Mm -hmm. But at one point, one of your family members had to tell you, okay, we are done for the day. We can now. My driver. Yeah, yeah. My driver here. Yeah. So he, he um, we went to go, I go get a mattress and a bed yeah. for the house that I'm at. And, uh, you know, then I wanted to go see an office because I want to get my office set up. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go get my Ghana card and all this stuff. And, you know, so we drop off the mattress. I'm like, all right, man, let's go to the, go back into the city to go finish up this up. He's like, man, he's like, you know, he's like, but you should just go inside and eat and yeah. relax and chill for the day and yeah. just, we'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow's another day. Yeah. And I was like, Hmm. I thought about it. I'm like, man, like, what are you talking about? Like, I got it. <laughs> but then I was like, you know what? You're probably right. And I went home, you know, yeah. my, my aunt pounded some fresh fufu. Yeah. And I sat down. I ate. You know, it's about 5, 6 p.m. So yeah. it's still kind of like light outside, nice mm -hmm. and warm. I ate outside, had a nice relaxing meal, mm -hmm. scrolled my phone, did some little bit of work and whatnot. Yeah. And it was relaxing. It was chill. I went yeah. to bed, got up the next day and handled what I had to handle. And I mm -hmm. just realized that, like, Everything is not so, it doesn't have to be so um, fresh. Yeah. yeah, because in the States, it's like you got bills coming up every two seconds, there's a bill coming. You got rent, you got uh, gas, you got electric, you got car note, phone bill, mm -hmm. student loans, this, 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 this. So you're constantly on this grind. Yeah. If you stop or slow down, the bills are going to come catch, catch up, up with you. you. Yeah. Whereas over here, it's like, you got your house paid, you paid, mm -hmm. your house is paid for the year, mm -hmm. you know, um, so you don't have that bill. You know, your car is paid cash for the most part, so you don't got that bill. So it's just like, it's just a matter of making the money. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then on top of that, I also come to find out that you can't rush things here. Like, things are going to happen at the pace that they're going to happen out here. And you just, if you try to force it, you're just going to be frustrated. Yeah, you know? that's so, true. <laughs> that's so true. Did you, I mean, had any misconception or whatsoever prior to coming back or even moving back? 
um, like preconceived like yeah. notions of what I thought I would see. Because you said you had, you were underwhelmed, so you might have. Yeah, found, what, what is yeah, that? Yeah, because you know, you... like I'm like, so when I got here, I was thinking like, okay, you know, like, yeah, it would be. I don't really know what I was expecting. Like, honestly. Uh, really? Yeah, I, I think I was like because I was like I guess I was expecting to see like, you know, like I don't know I guess more. <laughs> traditional things yeah. you know like i guess what i was thinking about was like how kumasi probably is because i know kumasi like. does a lot more traditional traditional wear traditional clothing and stuff like that um but also more like you know i guess space out because when i when i went to uh mm -hmm. to my first guy here i went straight to osu oh yeah, yeah so i guess if i had went to like maybe tema you know, because Tema was kind of, I think, what I was more expecting. It's more exactly. like suburban. Yeah. It's more things here, 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 here. Yeah. You know, it's like chill. It's like mm -hmm. nice houses mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. But like also, I'm like right in the middle. Well, so it's it's the hustle like and bustle. Man. Hustle and bustle. Yeah. So it felt much more like being in like, uh, if, I, if I was, it's like if I were related, mm -hmm. for somebody coming to the United States and, and expecting to see something, it's like, all right, if they came from out overseas and have this great idea of what the United States was, yeah. but then they end up going to a city like, let's say, um, like downtown Detroit yeah. or New York City, like mm -hmm, in like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like the Bronx somewhere yeah. in the Bronx or something yeah. like that, right? It's like, it's busy and, you know, like there's a lot going on and the buildings are kind of like, you yeah. know, older and stuff like that. So I think that probably was what it was, yeah. you know, because I just went straight there because I told my driver, I said, yo, take me to where like, you know, everybody would go to because mm -hmm. I wanted to see what the nightlife would be like, yeah. what things would happen. Yeah. Um, even though I'm not a nightlife person, I just wanted to see. See how it looks like, yeah. And so I thought maybe that might be it, but I think that's what it was. How, how do you know Osu and all this to mind? You mentioned this name so right. Oh, well, I mean, yeah. Tem I mean, because, you know, like I said, like my family is still it's from, from here. Yeah, so I always have known that my uncle was building houses all in Tema. He's got like six houses in Tema. Oh, nice. Uh, cause he's, he's a, uh, you know, got a rack of money doing pharmacy and stuff like that mm. so he's been building houses i got cousins that have been building houses out in dewenya and, mm. and community 25 that area i see i'm and i'm you know obviously my family's from kumasi and this whole story of part of what i'm here is to discover a lot about my family history so my father's father my grandfather mm -hmm. uh you know again the family was from kumasi he came to Tema because he was part of like the Ghanaian, like uh like Chiefs. secret service cia oh, okay, type yeah, 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 you know yeah. he was like the intelligence agency for, for ghana and so we, they moved the whole family to tema my my grandmother is part of the chief Tensi lineage in kumasi mm -hmm. so um that lineage comes through her so when we came to tema the fam all my family's been in tema but they sent my grandfather back to Kumasi to fight corruption in Kumasi. And he mm. ended up getting murdered in Kumasi, poisoned in Kumasi. And that's how the family started to, everybody started to go there. Separate. Because once he was gone, then mm. now everybody kind of was like on their own to figure things out. So they mm. kind of went to different places, mm. Tema, uh, Cape Coast. Uh, my father's father's family is from Cape Coast. So my great grandfather's uh, from Cape Coast and stuff mm. like that. Um, so it's just like learning about the family history. So I've understood different, different areas. Mm. Um, Interesting. Yeah, over time. What, what did the desire of getting to know your roots, finding who you are, came from? And what point did it dawn on you so much that you can't just say no, but just mm -hmm. buy your flight ticket and come to Ghana? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, that gets deep, man. I think a lot of people might, this might throw some people off, but um, uh, it's a spiritual thing. Mm. So for me, some years ago i started to get um some spiritual like interactions going on i didn't know where they were coming from mm. um i never really had a huge interest in um you know like when i was in high school and stuff i didn't care about ghana or going back home and all that stuff you know i was mm -hmm. a teenager and then as i got to early 20s i was working mm -hmm. and then i ended up in a situation where like some spiritual things started happening where you know let's just call it dreams right but they were kind of more than dreams mm -hmm. and like information started coming to me in dreams and when i would ask somebody in my family about it or somebody who's like a spiritual person about mm -hmm. it they would explain it like that's what that is and mm -hmm. i'm like well how could i possibly know that 
you know, and it started with uh, actually um, some Nigerian uh, uh, practices called Ifa, and mm-hmm. the certain spirits in Ifa would kind of come to me in my dreams, mm-hmm. and this was African spirits and spirituality. So I started to learn more about African spirituality from Ghana, uh, the Khan, you know, mm-hmm. Bosom to Ifa and the mm-hmm. Orishas. And so when I started to learn these things, I started to understand like our culture mm-hmm. and our power, our practices are very, very deep. Mm-hmm. That our spirituality is very, very deep. And even though um, it's been stripped from us in a, in a large part where people have turned away from our natural spirituality, believing that it's wrong or it's evil or whatever it may be, um, this to me was a clear cut sign that this was that it's it's true and mm. it's and it's it's proper and it's good. Once I start to understand that, I'm like, okay. When I started to learn more, I started to realize this is the same thing as mm-hmm. Christianity yeah. and Islam and all these other religions. It's the same foundational principles. Mm. One God, different spirits and different entities that interact with human beings. Mm-hmm. Some are good, some are bad. Yeah. So in Christianity, you have angels, archangels, and you have God. Yeah. You have demons. Mm. In, uh, in Islam, you have jinn, you know, the yeah. same thing. These are different spiritual entities. Mm-hmm. In Ifa, you have uh, Orisha. Mm-hmm. You know, Ghana, you have Obosom. Mm-hmm. These, but you still have one God. Everybody still believes in one God. You know, yeah. but Europeans came in and tried to make it seem as if we're worshiping many gods mm. and we're worshiping gods that are not the one God. Mm-hmm. But all these different um, names for God, whether it's Jin Ame, mm-hmm. whether it's uh, Olodumare, whether mm-hmm. it's Allah, whether it's God, mm-hmm. whether it's Elohim, mm-hmm. it's all the names for the same one okay, God. So, mm. Same thing in Egypt. Egypt believed, believed in one God for the most part, mm-hmm. but they had different sub deities and sub gods that mm-hmm. are um that have different interactions with humans and different mm-hmm. inter- implications in nature mm-hmm. so once i started to understand that this that a lot of what we have in western uh philosophy western spirituality is just african spirituality that's remixed mm-hmm. and given back to us yeah right that's when i said okay um i need to learn more about this and then i started to have interactions coming from my grandfather mm-hmm. my great grandfather through my dreams and stuff mm-hmm. like that and even people around me would start to have these weird dreams about this individual mm-hmm. where um you know and then tell me about it and it's like mm-hmm. it just you can't explain it and i don't really want to sound crazy some people might <laughs> think i'm sounding like really crazy so yeah. you just can't explain it. so i'm like okay then i started to have a really deep desire mm-hmm. to understand so yeah so then i started to say okay like this is clearly something in my ancestry it's clearly something that wants me to a be back here you. yeah and particularly in kumasi like mm-hmm. i know that you know in my spirit i know that i'm hearing a cry right now mm-hmm. but i know that where i'm supposed to be is in kumasi mm-hmm. for some reason i don't know what it is but i know that that's where like my spirit's calling me so mm-hmm. um i've just put a bigger emphasis on spirituality lately mm-hmm. uh following my own intuition mm-hmm. following my own inner voice and letting it guide me to where i need to be who mm-hmm. i need to be around what i need to do as opposed to leaning on my own understanding mm-hmm. of things and um you know just doing what my brain is like okay yeah let's do yeah. this because we can make money doing that or mm-hmm. i should do this because there's opportunity here i've learned now that those things always will will fall flat if you're not listening to your inner voice or listening to a higher mm. uh higher version of yourself and a higher version of god essentially. Yeah. interesting interesting but what what made you just recently travel out of the u.s for the first time well that gets a little bit deep so again because really? um the reason why i came recently is because Ooh, it's a lot. Mm. So uh, first, let me start on why I never have come mm. before in the first place. So my dad just never really had an interest in bringing me back, even though when I did start to express interest, he just he just doesn't feel like coming to, back to, he to brush Ghana. It off. He has some beef with Ghana from like um, he feels like he um, he wasn't accepted into the university here because of corruption. Mm. And so he, because they wanted him to pay, but he didn't have the so money So he has some pay. resentment towards... Yeah, he has some resentment to the system here. So he went to Europe and it was educated in Switzerland and Europe. And so he kind of felt like they accepted him, but mm-hmm. his own country, even though he had straight A's and mm-hmm. all that stuff, because he didn't have the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he has some like, you know, issue with that. And, you know, we've had our own, but we bumped heads about it a couple of times, but it is what it is. Mm-hmm. I know he's gonna come now that I'm here. Mm-hmm. Um, so as a young adult, I never came. 
Uh, my mom's from Liberia, so we never spoke tree in the house, so I didn't learn the language. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to 18, I got arrested and incarcerated for three years. So mm -hmm. when I came home, I had eight years of probation. And when you're on probation, I couldn't really leave the country. I see. So for, you know, eight, nine years now since I've been home, I was not able to leave. And so just recently, mm -hmm. those charges have been completely Dropped. eradicated from mm -hmm. my um my record and mm -hmm. now I'm fully able to travel and experience things. I see. Um, and so all of this actually happened all at the right time. It's all divine timing, mm -hmm. uh, honestly, because right at the time where I was now able to start traveling, mm -hmm. um, it's at the same point where I started to kind of go through this inner transformation mm -hmm. where I started to realize that this hustle and, and, and hustle and bustle life, uh, what we call hustle culture life, um, was just not leading me to a place where I was happy. You know, mm -hmm. we, we I made $5 million in our first two years of business mm -hmm. uh, as a company. We had a lot of cash sitting in our in our hands. Mm -hmm. um, and we just constantly took a lot of the money that we had coming in, you know, we're bringing in two, 300,000 a month. Mm -hmm. We were pushing it out and hiring people, doing this, doing that, because instead of kind of sitting with the money and relaxing, mm -hmm. we were like, oh, okay, now we got $5 million, we got this money, this money, this money, mm -hmm. let's put it here and invest it here. Let's invest it here. Let's build our team here. Let's build this business because we're like trying to mm -hmm. do chase, so much. Chase, chase. And then I realized that, you know, that is what led me to burn out very quickly. I see. Because now the more, um, you know, when you have a goal mm -hmm. or when you have a, uh, a business that you're trying to bring forth into the reality, it takes an immense amount of energy yeah. to birth something. Mm -hmm. You know, have to be very passionate to it. Very passionate. And a, and a business is just like a child. So mm -hmm. the same amount of energy it takes to formulate a child in the womb, mm -hmm. formulate the idea, formulate the concept, the conception of something, it takes time to nurture it. And then when you birth it, it takes an immense amount of energy to birth that thing. Mm -hmm. And then once you do birth it, you have to nurture it and give it more attention and things of that nature. Well, when you are somebody who you birth something, mm -hmm. you've used a lot of energy on that, and then immediately you go get pregnant again. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then you, you birth that thing, and immediately you go get pregnant again. Now you're pregnant with three newborn infants that you also have to feed and take care of mm -hmm. while you're trying. So eventually, you know, you're not going to be able to do all of that yeah. on your own. You, get you know, you need to have a nanny, you know, a nanny would be, you know, hiring managers for this business properly, training that nanny on how to manage your baby. Mm -hmm. Right. If you just hire a nanny off the street, they're probably not going to take care of your child the way that you would. Mm -hmm. So I realized that through that process, you know, we're running six or seven different companies at the same time. None of them fully mature enough to operate on their own mm. and so i just ended up getting extremely burnt out my days were literally just consisting of nothing but zoom meetings nothing but dealing with problems with employees problems with staff problems with this like then having to like deal with the you know community i have to teach also mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. do it and I have to travel and I have to shoot content so my days were and then i still have to be a father mm -hmm. right i still mm -hmm. have to be a father i still have to be a, a a significant other to uh to a girlfriend whatnot like too much pressure it's too much <laughs> and then on top of that financially mm -hmm. dealing with all the you know all the bills is on you as a man in general you 100 percent bills is on you regardless and now you gotta da -da 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 -da. it's just wait and if you operate like that for three four years i realized like, that's just not that's not the life there's so many people in the states are caught up in hustle culture mm -hmm. because that's what we've been programmed in and, and we've thought that you know when you're an entrepreneur you're escaping the rat race mm -hmm. right you think that you're like you know, I'm not a I'm not a nine to five or I'm not one of them on the plantation, right? But really, in reality, you work ten times more than a nine to five person because That's when that so nine true. to five person gets off of work at five o'clock, mm -hmm. oh, their day is there. They're not thinking about work. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're like five o'clock comes, they're off, but now you got to deal with whatever the problems are. Mm -hmm. You still got to deal with the bills that are coming mm -hmm. out. You still got to deal with whatever. It's twenty four seven businesses mm -hmm. on your mind. And for me, that's been since I was 13, I've been, money has been on my mind since I was 12, 13 years old. From really? Like, oh, bro, I started out mowing How lawns. How did it start? I started out mowing lawns. I, I needed money. I, I, I go make flyers, put them on mailboxes around the neighborhood, mm -hmm. put them on people's doors, call me to mow your lawn, boom, boom. So I go around my, my, my lawnmower, I mow lawns. Wow. Wintertime, I do the same thing with shoveling snow, boom. 
they shove the stuff. Da, 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 da. Mm. So I go around and I make flyers on Microsoft Word, print them out, put them on mailboxes, <laughs> shovel your snow. I do $100 for the whole season. Mm. Anytime it snows, I'll come and shovel your snow. Da, da, da. So I've been doing that. And then when I got to teenage years, mm. it was taking that money and then moving it to drugs like weed and ecstasy things oh, like really? that oh yeah like that was heavy and that's where how were I you at that time up. where hmm? where where yeah where's i living yeah where were you selling the stuff and then and everywhere i mean schools streets blah blah, blah. After I mean, what, school? State? what state oh virginia virginia, virginia okay yeah. I see. it's like between virginia maryland dc mm. we call it the dmv area so it's dc maryland and virginia mm. and uh so i'll just be ripping and running as soon as i got a car it was over with i would be here you know picking up something over there wow. dropping it off getting the money da, da, da. it was constantly flipping the money and then i got to a point where i started having people selling the drugs for me right you know three or four guys that were selling drugs for me in my area um i would get it in large quantities i break it down to so them you became like a drug lord no not drug lord. <laughs> they call me a drug lord but you know i was yeah. small time i was i just i would i had i would get a lump sum of cash mm -hmm. Because I also was trading at the time, funny enough, too. Trading. I would take the money and I would trade it in weed penny stocks. So I would I flip my money like that. So then I would take that money and then I cash it out, go get a lump sum. And once I get the lump sum, mm -hmm. I come back, break it down, give it to you, give it to you, give it to you. And then they'll get money and bring it back. So one of them ended up getting robbed for like two ounces of, of our product. And me and my guys just went and we went to the guy's house who took it. And, you know, we had a girl knock on the door to act like it was some. So he opens the door for the girl. Damn. Boom, we run in the house. We tie him up. We boom, 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 beat him up, trying to get the stuff back. And that's how I ended up getting incarcerated. I that was see. the whole situation, yeah. But it's all been around money. So I've literally lost three years of my life freedom mm -hmm. from, from money, eight years of my freedom of movement Movements from, from, from money. Uh, you know, my youth, a lot of it was spent behind money. I wasn't really playing and doing things like that as mm. much. Um, I had fun, but it was still, money was a core part of it. But you've, you've made millions. You've helped, yeah. not just you alone. For you've, sure. You've helped people make millions. Like, 100%. even before we jumped into this, this interview, you literally have 500 people following your traits. Yeah, yeah, right now. And yeah. trying to get this account from $1,000 to $10,000. And yeah. if you're able to succeed and everybody, 500 people following you, yeah. that's $5 million. $5 million, yeah. You, 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 you've helped a lot of people make money. Yeah. And, I mean, you've, you've, you've got it into trouble chasing money mm -hmm. right what makes you think that this new trajectory is gonna make a different you know for you because now what i realize is that money is not the motive mm. now what i really and i, and I realized money was never really the motive mm. and that that's something i didn't really understand i thought i was chasing the money but what i was actually chasing was the freedom mm. you see so i thought once i hit a certain number i'll be free and I can do whatever I want, mm. right? But then I realized that, okay, the reason why every time I hit these numbers, mm. I make a lot of money and then I lose it is because my mindset's in the wrong place. Mm. I have the money that I need to be free, but I keep thinking I need more, which is now doing the opposite of making me less free. I see. And then the less free I feel subconsciously, the less desire I want to do the thing that got me the money in the first place. Mm. So now I don't want to do it anymore. And the thing about me is I'm a, you know, I'm a Leah. I don't know if anybody believes in the strike, but if I don't want to do something, you're not going to, nothing in the world is going to make me do it. Really? And so, uh, nothing, not even the money. Will, nothing will make me do it. I don't care what it is. If, if I lose interest or passion or something, mm. nothing is going to make me do it. And so, you know, I now realize that, okay, I'm getting the money and the money is great. I'm making the money, 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 money. Mm -hmm. But now I'm losing my freedom, losing my freedom, losing my freedom. So subconsciously there's this paradox happening where now I don't, I don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't care That's about it. it anymore. I don't want, I, I'm not passionate about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so um, now I realize, okay, what I'm looking for is freedom. So mm -hmm. now I won't take anything on that's going to jeopardize my freedom. Now I want to make money and the money that I'm going to make is in things that I have freedom on mm -hmm. i don't i don't want anything where i'm going to be obligated to uh to have to do something for example now i've, I've revamped my mindset to now building my company more as a publishing company mm. publishing the information for people to consume to make their investing decisions mm. right that's something that i can do peacefully i can have build a staff here in ghana that can just help publish the content we run that and now 
the obligation is not, oh, I have to show up this time to teach a class, to teach a class, I have to manage this person, that person, I don't have to do all that. Now I do the publishing peacefully, mm. okay, build that up and I can sell that entire company mm -hmm. for millions of dollars. Mm, interesting. I, built, I made textbooks, I built, did stock market textbooks. The only stock market textbooks in the world that I've seen mm -hmm. for, for trading um, and built that. I can scale that up and sell that. That's a publishing thing. Mm -hmm. So those are the things and the types of business now that, that I drive mm -hmm. a passion for because mm -hmm. I still have my freedom there. I like that. Now, I still want us to go back to your, your story a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, because even though you are at this point where obviously you've, you've had years of experience trading stocks, mm -hmm making millions maybe somebody is there they are willing to carry the cross mm -hmm. um can you kind of elaborate on in details on how you even built and learned the craft of trading and for people who are interested in, in, sure. in, in embarking on that journey yeah no when it comes to trading trading now is 10 times mm -hmm. easier to learn than it was when i started because when i started this was back in 2000 and uh, my dad introduced it to me when I was 13, 2003. Mm -hmm. And then in 2011 or 2012, when I came home from prison, I knew that I needed a skill set that I could make money on because I was making like $7 an hour. I'm good. I was making like $7 an hour, um, you know, doing construction. And that wasn't enough to make a life. My son was about to be born and I realized I needed to do something else. So, mm -hmm. um, and so trading was an option. And back then, there wasn't a lot of YouTube videos and things. There wasn't courses and stuff. I had to, you know, go to a, a brokerage uh, that had an in-person branch and learn there. And so it was been a long journey of losses, taking a lot of losses and learning from the losses. The thing about trading is you really learn the best from the losses you take. I see. You know, uh, when you take losses, it forces you to learn of like, what did I go, what, what went wrong? What, what did I do? What can I do better? When you keep winning all the time, you think you know everything, so you're not going to learn. I see. So um, you can learn from somebody else's losses and pay a coach or something like that, or you can learn from your own losses. So, um, but with trading, um, it's a great skill set to have. You know, you can make money anytime on your phone, on, on your laptop. It's not as complicated as people think it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty straightforward. It's really just a matter of looking at different patterns and shapes and colors and clicking the right button at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's, that's, that can get you freedom in and of mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. um, and not just that, but you can also trade what's called funded trading programs. You can trade other uh, there's companies that put money to the side for people who know how to trade. Mm -hmm. And if you pass the test, you can trade their money and you split the profit 80-20. So that's a great okay. way to make passive, uh, not passive money, but make money without spending your own money also. Mm -hmm. So this is a lot of opportunity to trade and to, to have freedom that you don't have to work for every dollar mm -hmm. the same way you do when you have to go to a job mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and it takes time. It mm -hmm. takes time to learn. It takes time to master. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that now. I mean, obviously, you've, you've lived all your life in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, you've made millions in the U.S. Um, you've identified opportunities there, capitalized on that, build your own career there. What are you seeing or what do you have in the pipeline here? And I think behind cameras, we were talking about how you, you believe that even this trajectory will bring you even much more joy, yeah. peace, and even potentially Anybody. money. Mm -hmm than you know you you might have made in the u.s can you just elaborate on that um transition um and part of it yeah for sure so um you know i see obviously it's opportunity abound in africa period especially in ghana um i mean abound and so with the transition back to to mm -hmm. this country back to africa the opportunities that i see are much larger you know, in the U.S., if I say I want to start a company doing food processing, yeah, you know, that's taking that's millions of dollars in and of itself of a venture to even think about doing. It's not a business that anybody can get up and say, hey, I want to do this thing. Here, I see crazy opportunity in things like that where, you know, you can go to a farm and talk to a farmer and say, hey, I want to process, uh, I want to buy chickens directly from you. And you get a chicken processing machinery mm -hmm. for X amount of thousands of dollars from a, uh, a uh, commercial man manufacturer. manufacturer. Mm -hmm. You get your space, which is already going to be cheap because, uh, you know, land and things are pretty cheap out here. 
You have staff, which is going to be cheap because the, 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 the conversion of what people are getting paid out here versus... Relatively to America. So relative to America. I mean, some people will get paid $100, $200, $300 US, mm -hmm. and that's good money here. Mm -hmm. Versus over there, for one standard employee, I was paying, for most of my employees, I was paying sixty dollars to $100,000 a year salary. And so, you know... For one person? For one person. Interesting. And we had a staff of 30. 30. 30. Mm -hmm. So Damn. just imagine our payroll, we're spending $200,000 a month in just payroll at one point. Here, $200,000 a month is like, I, I don't even want to, I don't even want to, I don't even want to factor, I don't even want to think about what That's you can build, of money. what you can build here with $200,000 a month mm -hmm. is, is, is sickening, it makes my stomach sick to think about. So here, the opportunities are so much stronger where you can get into industrial businesses. Getting into industrial business in the U.S. is just, is for the average person, is just not even in the realm of reality. Mm -hmm. Here, mostly anybody can, can do it with a little bit of capital and a good amount of hustle mm -hmm. and things of like that. And so um, that's why I think that there's a lot bigger opportunity here mm -hmm. to be able to do things, whether it be exporting goods to, uh, to uh, outside and processing mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. exporting out. You know, Ghana and, and Nigeria and countries like that, I mean, the statistics are crazy when it comes to how much is produced here mm -hmm. versus how much is imported. A lot of the, our countries are growing pineapples ghana like number one for pineapples uh uh, uh cocoa um you know we're like we're producing the cocoa and then exporting mm -hmm. it to get processed yeah. and then importing it back, back as chocolate again. you know nigeria producing tomatoes exporting out processing to tomato paste and then importing back at three four times the price as tomato paste it's like, it's crazy. And so you got people like Dan Cote and, and others who are investing a lot of money into the infrastructure for processing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, that is just an industry that I think is just is massive mm -hmm. um, because obviously, you know, that is something that doesn't go away quickly. You know, certain things can be fads today, tomorrow. Um, you know, when I look at the trading space, it's like, okay, I've watched the trading space go from a handful of people teaching it. So now every time we teach somebody how to trade, that person now, they get a little success and then they want to go run and teach some, you know, teach their own program, yeah. right? Because there's money in it. Mm -hmm. So it's like with education, you're like constantly training your, you know, competitors essentially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's literally people right now who are, who started out in my program, who I taught hand to mouth, you know, literally sat down hours with them, taught them, gave them everything. Mm -hmm. And then they figured, figured it out, and then now they yeah, created their own people. program, right? Yeah. They went and created their own program, and then trying to come in and take people from out of our program. Mm. It's that type of thing. And I, and I, I don't, it's neither here nor there. I don't even care. Interesting. Right? But it's just the idea and the psychology behind it is, it's like, it's a race to the bottom ultimately, because eventually it's, it's going to get so saturated where everybody, you know, there's going to be thousands and thousands, which there already is, mm -hmm. right? So the education space where we are is cool, but industrial building processing it's plants and things that it's not saturated. And 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 you're always gonna have people and and and, and food. You're always gonna need mm -hmm. to have food. You're always gonna need to have items, mm -hmm. things of that nature. As the industry grows here in mm -hmm. uh, in Africa, which we all know it is, mm -hmm. and so the demand is gonna continue to increase while the supply is still small. small. So I think that's a huge industry to be in. Mm -hmm. There's other industries, obviously, like. Um, Hospitality. I've mm. seen hotels in right here in Osu, the, hosp the uh, hotel I was staying at, yeah. owned by Lebanese. Yeah. Right. And I'm, my mom is half Lebanese. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's cool. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to, to know that even the water, the bottle of water you got right there. It's a bottle, Lebanese company. It's yeah. a Lebanese company. Yeah. <laughs> and ask me, tell me how many, how many other water brands are there in Ghana mm, right not now? Not much. About four, that's five. That's damn near the only one that I've seen. That's the number one. Uh, the number one water brand that I've seen out here. It's massive, mm -hmm. but owned by Lebanese, mm -hmm. right? And so um, the hotel I was at, owned by Lebanese, the whole of Osu, damn near, mm -hmm. what I saw, most of it was owned by Lebanese. You go down to Spintex, most of those places are owned by Chinese, mm -hmm. Indian, Lebanese, right? Um, import machine, m materials. Mm -hmm. So, and I, look, there's nothing wrong with it. At the end of the day, they're helping to build the country. So, 
I don't take that away from them. Mm. But there's so much opportunity here also for black Americans, yeah. black people, diasporans, mm -hmm. and Native but, Ghanaians to come in and build. You know, what I've observed so far, the conversations that I've had with African Americans, they don't want to come, right? Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. So, I mean, ratio, mm -hmm. it, it's more like 90-10. 90% mm -hmm. of, of African Americans don't want to come. Mm -hmm. One, they would, because of mosquitoes, malaria. That's like because excuses. Of, because of <laughs> insects. You know, like all those petty, petty things, doom saw, the no, light no, going off and on. No. Uh, you know what I think it is? What, what I think it is, is mm. um, it is what they've seen so so far on you know tv we've we've been programmed obviously to look at africa in a certain kind of way um but even for the ones who still know and they, they don't want to i would say the thing is the thing about it mm -hmm. anytime there's a new opportunity doesn't matter what it is mm -hmm. let's just in stocks or crypto same thing when cryptocurrency came out there's a certain amount of people who are willing to take that step forward and explore it and learn it and take the opportunity and those people become wealthy yeah then there's another group of people who wait to see the first people go do so it seat first. to now come in and then step foot. And then there's the masses who end up coming and then they end up living in the world that was built by the people who took the step they forward. They become slaves to that system. Exactly. So they become the people who... So the opportunity and the risk is always going to be in balance. The bigger the risk you take, the bigger the opportunity that you're going to get. So in the beginning when something is being really developed and the opportunities are still there, that's where the most opportunities. And the truth of the matter is, you don't even want everybody. I, trust me when I tell you, you don't want all the black Americans coming over here anyway. <laughs> that's a whole other problem. And I'm going to say it. You know what I'm saying? You don't want all the black Americans coming over here. You want the ones who are willing to, to put their best foot forward, the ones who have skills the ones who have means the ones who have the desire the mindset the right mindset um that's what you want same thing with america the reason why america is what it is today is because foreigners from all over the world they choose their greats they saw exactly they, they saw the them. opportunity in america so what do they do whatever they whatever they needed to do to get out of their country to go to america they did it that is a person who has a certain mindset they have a mindset to, I want to do this thing. I'm going to do whatever I want to, I can do, need to do to get there. Mm -hmm. And then they come over to find opportunity. So that's why when you, you hear Americans' stories of uh, first generation, whether it's African, mm -hmm. Spanish, Indian, whatever, when they, I came to this country with 30 cents in my pocket, and other, because their mindset was different. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, the foreigners that you have in the States are a different type of person. You know, they're, they're more... Uh, work ethic is different. It's the same thing now in Africa. The black Americans who are coming over to Africa to build, these are people who are hungry for opportunity. These are people who are, if they're not hungry for opportunity, they at least uh, have the mindset of peace and harmony. Mm -hmm. They're looking for freedom. They're looking for culture, right? It's the right energy. Whereas the masses that might be back in the States, they might have the wrong intentions. They might come, oh, I'm trying to come in, you know, whatever it might be you know they might not have the right intentions or the right means so mm. i would say that it's exactly what it should be you know is 90 10. let mm. the 10 percent of the people who who have want to put their best foot forward to build mm. come in and and do that mm. help make the country better make the country great mm. and reap the benefit from that and have a mutually beneficial system and then when everybody else and this is what we're seeing already look at the people who, most people just started coming to ghana because of december yeah Dirty December, actually, yeah. And who who was the one who really pushed that? Wasn't it the, the uh, wasn't it uh, bro that does the um, uh, what's it called Afro and stuff yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A big part of that yeah, was yeah. was him, right? Mm -hmm. And this is somebody who, you know, lived abroad, came, did this and the third, built something that now is attracting people to come mm -hmm. and experience it. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's just eventually it'll pick up and and be what it needs to be. But for now, it's cool. Yeah. What do you say to African Americans who said we sold them into slavery? I will tell them to shut the fuck up. That's what I would say. <laughs> I would say that's what I would say. Really? I'm gonna look right at the camera. If y'all still talking that stupid shit in 2024, you can shut the hell up. Because this is why. Mm. This is why. If you have somebody, right? If uh let's just say, you know, you have three people and you have one person who has a gun to somebody's head and says, Hey, punch that guy or I'm gonna shoot you. Mm. And that guy punches you. 
Are you gonna be upset at the person who punched you or the person who shot you? Yeah, who, who was holding that gun to you? Who's holding a gun yeah. to you? If you don't have enough common sense to understand that the people who came in and took you into slavery in the first place are the same people who came into this country and this uh, continent and forced a lot of the people, uh, uh, governments who were here mm. to do these types of things, they didn't have much choice, a lot mm. of them, right? Because at the end of the day, okay, if I come in and I say, I got a boatload of guns and I can either trade mm -hmm. these guns with you for some slaves that you can you either give me your, mm -hmm. you know, captured people, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, whatever it may be, um, and give me them. Or I could take these guns to your enemy next door who y'all been beefing with the whole time and he can use them on you. What are you going to do? Mm. Mm -hmm. And even at that time, the idea of slavery that a lot of the kingdoms had here was not the same idea of slavery that the whites had. Yeah. You know, when people here, even right now, right mm. now, 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 when you go into somebody's home west, means yeah. and things of that nature, they might have a houseboy, a house girl yeah. who helps do things around the house. Yeah. My aunt, you know, has some uh, uh, two girls that are in the house right now. Mm -hmm. They help him pound the food. food. Yeah. She calls them, hey, go come do this. Yeah. They manage the store, et cetera, et cetera, right? To some people, they might look at that as it called servitude, slavery, et cetera, slavery, even yeah. though it's not. It's a mutually mm -hmm. beneficial system. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking it back to those days, their concept of what these people are looking for is like that. Mm. They're thinking that, okay, you're just looking for some people to do some stuff for you, cool. Yeah. They're not thinking that you're about to rape them, you're about yeah. to kill them, you're about to treat them like animals and things of that nature. These are these, the people, the Europeans who came in and did stuff, they like to consider themselves civilized, but these people are extremely Most animalistic and uncivilized in nature. The native mm -hmm. Africans who were here mm -hmm. had a much more civilized understanding of what servitude looked like. And so if you still are thinking in 2024 that, oh, black Ghanaians or Africans sold us into slavery, so fuck them and da 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 then you're just an idiot and you deserve to be wherever you are in life and to stay wherever you're at in life because you can't formulate a common sense thought on your own. Mm. These type of narratives is what's so dangerous in dividing black and African people because this is what society wants mm. from us. Mm. They don't want us to be, United. to come together. How look at what's already so powerful about that now. You see, black I've seen some of your episodes of black Americans coming and doing amazing things. Yeah. Meanwhile, Europeans have been coming to Ghana doing the same things ten times over for years. Yeah. Well, they don't want you coming in to build something that can compete with what they got going on. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. They don't want you to be able to come and create a water bottle company and create your own water that we got our own thing. Like, yeah. why would they want that? Yeah. So they're benefited and in, in, invested in keeping us divided mm. and keeping us consistently fighting with each other. Mm. Africans saying black Americans might be lazy or, yeah. or this, that, or third, or ghetto, because mm. that's what they see on TV. Yeah. Oh, Americans thinking that Africans are uncivilized or this, that, and the third, because that's what they see on TV. So everybody's invested in, you know, keeping us apart. And mm. so once we, once we actually can mm -hmm. defeat that, it's over for everybody. Do, do you think, I mean, 2024, we do understand each other as Africans and African Americans? Do you think we, we understand each other to this day? Understand each other? I think it's better. It's 10 times better than what... Mm -hmm. it's, Five minutes. Okay. It's 10 times better than what, um, than what I've seen in the past. Mm. You know, my family is first generation, 60 years old, 70 years old, 50 years old. Their concept and understandings of black Americans had been skewed over the years, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because of what they also experienced when they got to the country. All of them have some story of when I got here, you know, black Americans treated me like this. Mm -hmm. And they never forgot it to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, they never forgot it to this day that they were treated differently or treated whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so not that it's anybody's fault, right? Because this is, again, it's what people design. used to in the mm -hmm. 70s people had certain concepts of africans 80s people had certain concepts of africans africans had certain concepts of black americans africans are looking at black americans like y'all been here this whole time with all this opportunity y'all walk around like the, but they don't have the understanding of black americans have been through so much in this country they don't know that they didn't grow up learning about civil rights and things of that nature to the degree 
of what it was. They learn about civil rights and, okay, Martin Luther King, et cetera, cool, but they don't understand about redlining mm -hmm. and gentrification mm -hmm. and projects and the crack epidemic and this and that. All the things that we've had to face as Americans, black Americans, mm -hmm. they didn't have that understanding. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? So black Americans didn't have the understanding of what Africans went through during the time of having to sell mm -hmm. people into slavery, their own people into mm -hmm. slavery. And Africans didn't have the understanding of what black Americans had to went, go through being under, directly under the oppression of white Americans and all the psychological torture that has been done to mm. black people over mm. this time. Mm. So now I think that information is much more widespread and social media is available for us to truly understand each other. That it, I think is changing a lot now. Mm. Okay, so understanding each other as black people um, would you say you were, what, what did they teach you in school when you were growing up in high school in the U.S.? About what? About like black history or even when, what African Americans went so, through? So with black history in America, we learn about civil rights. We learn about slavery, obviously. Mm -hmm. And all those things are valid. The problem is that we don't learn about African history, you know, if you were to ask the average black person or the average American mm -hmm. to name five kingdoms of Africa, I don't know that they could give you one except for maybe Egypt. Mm. I don't know anything about Timbuktu, the Malian Empire, the Shanti Empire, the Songhai Empire. They don't know much about any of these things. They might touch on it in school for like, a, if you were to look at a, a history book mm -hmm. in the States, African history might be half a page. They'll go through, European history is like four chapters. American history is a whole, that's a whole class of itself. Chinese history might be a couple chapters. You learn all about Mayans mm -hmm. and Aztecs and Incans. So they would act as if African history almost doesn't even exist. exist. Mm. And so most people can't name five African historical figures outside of like Shaka Zulu and like Nelson Mandela, right? Um, but we can name five European ones like this, from Queen Elizabeth to Napoleon to all these people. So we learn mostly in school that as black Americans, we are slaves that fought to be become free. Then we fought for civil rights. But at each one of those steps, mm -hmm. it was still ultimately white people who decided to give us those things. Mm -hmm. So we don't learn about like, oh, you know, this slave rebellion established some type of, you know, thing mm -hmm. that, that established something. It was always, okay, well, yeah, they, they begged for it and we decided to give it to them. So it still mm -hmm. comes from a perspective of, like, okay, we, we did it for you. You still didn't achieve anything on your own for the most part. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, it's about what you overcame and what you endured, but not necessarily what you achieved. Mm -hmm. You see, so they don't like to teach us about the things that we've achieved in history. Mm -hmm. They don't like to teach us the things that we built in history. Even Haiti, mm -hmm. right here in, uh, right there in the Americas, Americas yeah. Haiti is the only country in the history of the world, of planet Earth, mm -hmm. where the slaves overthrew the government and established their own government that still stands today. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you about the gladiators and uh, what's his name? Uh, Spartacus yeah. and, and uh, did this great rebellion and we learn a lot about that but they don't talk about a lot about how the Haitian revolution the importance and the implications mm -hmm. of the Haitian revolution mm -hmm. you see so like there's things like that that I just is missing from the United States education system when it comes to black history and African history in particular and a lot more needs to be done about that because if you don't know where you come from, mm -hmm. you don't know where you're going, you don't know who you are, mm -hmm. right? If you don't believe that there's anything that you've been done that's been great that compares, mm -hmm. you know, they'll tell you about the, you know, Egyptian, we learn all about Egyptian yeah. pyramids and things like that, but even then they tell you that those people weren't you. Yeah. They tell you some else, somebody else that, that doesn't look like you, even though it's technically not. Or they aliens. Or aliens even. They even go so far as to put it on aliens. <laughs> like, Napoleon went around to Egypt and blew all the noses off the faces of the statues mm. because they were black noses. Mm. He took all of the history in the, the library of Alexandria. They took all of that information to libraries. Mm. They did the same thing in Timbuktu and Mali. They took all the information and history 
out of the out of the place. They even have entire you have an entire area of study called Egyptologist. Mm. You don't have Europeologists, Asianologists. You have Egyptologists. What is it that y'all are doing over there? Mm. There's other countries that have uh, pyramids and things of that nature. To me, a lot of what they have established as Egyptologists is to ensure that they have whitewashed, whitewashed the history, history enough and to say, well, this person is a professional on Egypt, so they know everything. Mm -hmm. And so they whitewash it enough to the point where it can no longer be recognized as black or claimed as black. Mm -hmm. So I think that a lot of these things, you know, when you really sit down and look at it, it's like they've gone through great lengths mm -hmm. to keep black people believing mm -hmm. that we're not capable of achieving great things. Mm -hmm. So and, uh, that's how I look at it. And most Africa, I've heard some African Americans say they are not Africans. We should stop calling them Africans. Yeah, that's another. That's another. Uh, you know, a bunch of um, misinformation and things of that nature. So there's a narrative mm -hmm. in America that Black Americans are Native Americans, right? Which I don't deny that there are Native Americans who were Black, mm -hmm. right, or Black-skinned people. Mm -hmm. Some people even go so far as to believe that slavery is a conspiracy theory and that is, the slaves never actually came to America at all. They actually found black people here and we actually didn't come from West Africa. Africa. Now, to those people, I would say this. Hmm. Yes, there were dark-skinned Native Americans, even black Native Americans. Their hair texture, their physical features are very different than West Africans per se. Even still, Southern Native Americans, who would be considered like the Olmecs, a lot of those people were black people who came from the Kingdom of Mali. Abu Bakr II, uh, you know, the grandfather or grand uncle to, uh, uh, to Mansa Musa, mm -hmm. led an expedition of ships over to the Americas way before the Europeans did mm. and landed here. And you have the Olmec heads, the statues that depict people who have very similar features to African people. Mm. So it's not that Africans have not existed here or black people have not existed here. However, to deny the fact that majority of Native Americans are exactly what we know Native Americans to look like, the long flowing hair, et cetera, et cetera, is to... Uh, it's, it just would be asinine. Mm. And then I would also say this. This isn't scientific, but I think everybody can know it in their spirit. Black people across the world, it does not matter if you're Jamaican, mm. Haitian, from Georgia, from New York City, from West Africa, from South Africa. There's certain things that black people carry in our spirit. There's a certain way we behave. Mm. There's a certain way of music, mm -hmm. that we, the way we move our bodies, yeah. the dances we do, the cultural things that we have, even if we never have even seen each other, right? Um, the, the music, the, the music that we have, the culture, the vibe. Native American culture is completely different to a, a, any black culture that you would see mm -hmm. around the world. Mm. You know, the rhythms, the beats, the, the, and yes, they had drums and things of that nature, but it's different. You know, African, uh, uh, the African culture, the African mm -hmm. spirit, African gene is just, you can take a black person here in the United States and look at certain behaviors and things that they do, and you can take a person in Africa and certain things that they do, the, the taste of food that they mm -hmm. even like, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the... You know, we, uh, we did a thing back in the day, we were talking about twerking, right? And black people in, in the States twerking and how it has roots in African mm -hmm. dance practices. We're from DC, I'm from like DC area. There's go-go. Go-go music mm -hmm. is very similar to traditional African music, African beats, African drums. It's just different. Mm -hmm. And so I would just say that, you know, to people who, who make those statements, you know, if that's what you choose to believe, fine. Mm. We're in the age of 2024. 20, you can believe whatever you want to believe. Mm. You have people who are men who believe they're women. You have people who are white that believe they're black. Mm -hmm. If you want to believe you're not African, you're Native American, or you're whatever it is you want to believe, fine. Mm. That's up to you. I don't think it matters at the end of the day. But the fact of the matter is that um, genetically, there are very strong similarities from your hair texture mm -hmm. to 
you know, uh, other things about yourself that the traditional black person in America mm -hmm. would share with the typical black person in Africa. Mm -hmm. And of course, they also have been mixed with other things, European and Native American. And yeah, it's kind of a melting pot type of vibe. But mm -hmm. to deny that part of your personality or that part of your history, um, you're doing yourself a disservice. I like that. Now, there's somebody in the comment section who often types something like, I'm better off here in America. And I'm very sure that he's living in like an, a studio apartment, <laughs> making like $60,000 yeah, a year. Yeah. And here you are, I'm sitting next to someone who have made millions and still making mm -hmm. millions online and trading stocks. And you still see the opportunity here. Mm -hmm. But the average person is so myopic in a way that yeah. they can't see the opportunities here. Yeah. What would you say to people like that? Who, who I'll say he's 100% right. He is better off where he is because with his mindset, mm -hmm. That his mindset suits him right where he's at. Mm. You know, that's what I think. I think that, you know, you coming over here with that type of mindset, you will be better off where you're at because it's going to be a miserable time for mm -hmm. you. I don't think, you know, you'll get along with the people. I don't think you'll, you know, you'll really get what you should get out of mm -hmm. it. I think Africa is what you make it. Um, and so I think when people come to Africa or look to come to Africa or talk about coming to Africa, then they come with the right mindset, mm -hmm. you know. And again, I'm not an expert on Africa. I've been here for all of what, a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but knowing my people, of uh, people who I've grown up with, my family, my culture, and, and how I know things to be, you know, I just know that you need to come with the right mindset or, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to have the experience that you should. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, stay where you're at. I like that. If you do have any final message to the people watching, um, what would that message be? Um, I would say the message would be uh, to look for similarities and not differences mm -hmm. uh, in anything that you do. And that, that was a huge thing for me spiritually when I started to branch off from Christianity and start to learn other religions, Islam, mm -hmm. uh, traditional African practices, whatever it may be, Hinduism, Buddhism. I look for the similarities, the common thread between all of them. Mm -hmm. And that's where I find the truth. Uh, I find the truth in the similarities and not the differences. I think society will have you focusing on the differences. Mm -hmm. And when you focus on the differences, you'll always find a way to uh, isolate yourself. And so... Um, same thing with our cultures you know if i come here and i look for the differences of what i'm used to in america versus what i see here you mm -hmm. know i find a, a lot less you know of a, a positive experience mm -hmm. um if i look at differences between you and me you know i'm focused on those differences if i look at our similarities in the way we think and the way we have goals and the things that we're looking to do um you know now i can find an opportunity where we can collaborate in the same way with everybody across the world whether it's black people or africans africans with asians asians with europeans europeans whatever if we start to look focus more on how we're similar i'll even say you know not too long ago mm -hmm. i was on social media and i'm stumbled upon the white side of instagram <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know this guy had made a video about the things that he experiences with his wife or his girlfriend and, and you know their relationship dynamic. And I'm like, damn. I said, man, everybody goes through the same thing with their significant other. Mm -hmm. And I start to realize, like, man, we all, as men, as men, there's certain things that we're all looking for. As African men, Asian men, European men, we all want to succeed. Mm -hmm. We all want to achieve. We all want to take care of our families. We all want to experience life and we all want to impose our will mm -hmm. on the world to a certain degree women no matter what demographic they all want a man who can support them can value them can love them now yes there's outliers and things of that nature but generally there's certain things that women are going to want to they're going to want to nurture mm -hmm. something some bodies you know whether it's children or their significant other so if they if we focus on the similarities between us as a group yeah, you might be Indian, and your Indian women might have a different mm -hmm. way of doing things. Indian men might have a different mm -hmm. way of doing it, but ultimately, we all have the same goals and the same experience. So, mm -hmm. I would just encourage everybody out there, you know, Black American diaspora, you know, Caribbean, African, focus on the similarities that we have between us, mm -hmm. nurture those to get those things, 
and figure out how you can collaborate. It could start right in your own backyard. You don't have to come all the way over here to do it. Mm -hmm. You could do it right in your own uh, own backyard. Mm -hmm. So what do you have going on, I uh, mean, for in Ghana here, or what, what are your plans, um, if you're willing to share to the people? Well, I'll share some of my plans, mm -hmm. you know. So, but yeah, one of my, my biggest plan here, um, outside of really learning about my family culture and history, uh, I want to move my company here, mm -hmm. Chico, mm -hmm. and build Chico.com as a financial media platform, media site. Um, I want to um, set up an office here where I can teach and train people on financial literacy, financial, uh, finances, finances in general, business, but also skill set development. So digital skill sets, I think, are the key to Africa developing into the future, whether that be with AI and learning how artificial intelligence works and how to leverage AI for your benefit, um, learning about digital skill sets like e-commerce, mm -hmm. like website development, graphic design, things of that nature. I want to work with people in the States mm -hmm. to bring them over and pay them to train people who come into our, our, pro, our program and our platform to get those skill sets. Mm -hmm. And I want to build a company here that focuses on doing business uh, abroad mm -hmm. because I think one of the most powerful things we can do here as black Americans mm -hmm. is to import U.S. dollars, mm -hmm. import euros into the Africa, here. into That's here, economy. because when we do that, we're able to help stimulate an economy. A lot of people here, the the, the currency is continuously getting devalued and de uh, and, and and dragged down. Mm -hmm. But when you're able to import foreign currency that you know you can then turn around and um, you know, do more with and build more and, and, and impact more people, more lives. Mm -hmm. Well, now, you know, that becomes a thing. I'll say this also. Mm -hmm. Economies like India, mm -hmm. Philippines, these countries have been built off of this exact model. Yeah. India, you know, back in the early 80s and things of that nature, invested heavily in developing their call center infrastructure IT. and developing IT skills. And now I, Indians are the number one people mm -hmm. in IT. That didn't happen by accident. Mm -hmm. That happened from individuals who, who learned IT, decided to come back to the country and, and, and build something that could train their people on those skills. The government supporting those people to build out that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And now that entire country mm -hmm has been built off of the back of IT mm -hmm. and call center development. And they were able to get contracts with foreign companies yeah, to get paid in foreign currency mm -hmm. to develop their countries in India. Mm -hmm. Same thing in Philippines. Right now, freelancing is huge in the Philippines mm -hmm. where they're getting paid 5 $6 an hour US, which for us is mm -hmm. cheap, mm -hmm. but for them is massive. Mm -hmm. And so there's an entire industry and economy that's being built there. So I see an opportunity here mm -hmm. to build the same thing to develop Ghanaian skill sets. Mm -hmm. You know, Ghana's uh, no, you know number one language, uh, the number one language mm -hmm. actually is English. English, mm -hmm. because you have tree, you have Ghana, you have all these different different dialects, but the one that everybody knows and speaks it, it, at least is English. English yeah. So they're able to have, and the accent is better than what you might get in mm -hmm. India or Philippines. It's a lot easier for the person, uh, the average person to understand. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for mm -hmm. Ghanaians to become freelancers and uh, and supply services to the rest of the world mm -hmm. where they can um, get opportunity. So I'm, I'm gonna be participating in that process. I like that. How do people find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at quay.trades, T-R-A-D-E-S. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that'd be probably the number one place. And do I get a chance to join your community? <laughs> Automatically, man. We're going to set up Chico Ghana and that's it. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's it, guys. Where we are currently filming this video is called Gendu Place. Gendu Place is a co-working space located in East Lagoon. If you're working remotely and you want somewhere to, you know, plug and play, there's a place for you. They do have activities happening every Friday, live band. Um, they do have movie nights. You know, make sure you check it out. And uh, if it's your first time here, please don't forget to like the video, share it to friends and family, comment down. Let's get the engagement going. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's just say bye bye to the people watching. All right, peace. See you.